Hello and welcome back to the Complete Tech Heads podcast with me, Tommy Edwards. Uh, so this week I am talking with Paul Matthews, or better known as AI for Teachers on, on Twitter. Well, his Twitter name is Paul Matthews, AI for Teachers. Paul is a teacher uh, who is also a founder of an AI platform called My Teacher Aid, which is designed obviously for teachers. So this conversation really is about an area that I find fascinating, which is AI in the education space. Uh, so my view on this is that really the whole education space is going to be shaken up by AI. Uh, as you'll hear in the pod, I don't think there is many areas of education that as we currently know it that won't be changed and Paul has a really great analogy for the way that he thinks about this but um, I think that the very idea of coursework the very idea of learning in general is entirely going to be shaken up everybody has an AI assistant now so we get into that uh, we talk about opportunities we talk about threats as well it sounds like the teachers right now are grappling a lot with essentially cheating uh you know kids using um ai tools in a way that is not helping them to learn it's just subbing for them and doing their homework for them and they're not learning anything which clearly is the major threat in this um in the deployment of ai in this space but of course the opportunities are huge and endless not just for the kids learning now but also for teachers and the way that they are educating kids um, and that is the space that Paul operates in um, which we go on to talk about as well. So I hope you enjoy this conversation. I certainly did and here it is. Paul, how are you doing? I'm my old, old friend. Uh, <laughs> I'm doing incredibly well, thank you. How are you? Yes, uh, I'm very well, thank you. Um, so we uh, have only really met on Twitter. We connected. I've kind of seen your content around AI and education, and that's obviously something that I'm very interested in myself. So I wanted to get you on. Um, I would love it if you could give us a brief intro to yourself and how you're coming at the wonderful and exciting world of AI. Sure. Too easy. Well, look, my name is Paul Matthews. I'm a secondary teacher from Hobart, which is Tasmania. That's Australia's southernmost state. You got to tell me this, Tom. Have you ever been to Tasmania? Uh, I have not. No, no. It's a very, very long way away from uh, from Crystal Palace. Uh, I think. No, sure. Um, no, look, it's a beautiful place. This is God's own country, mate. Let me tell you, I love it down here. I've got <laughs> all my uh, all my family down here. My aunties and uncles, and I'm Dutch, so my oma and opa and all the rest of it. So I, I went to school down here in uh, Hobart. I now teach at the same school I went to, and I'm a third generation educator. So really education runs in the veins. It's somewhat of a family business, I guess. So I'm um, in education. I've been in there for a number of years and just been really fascinated by artificial intelligence. I'm the sort of person who is always looking to leverage technology to, to make my life easier as a teacher and to make students' lives better. And really, I think the artificial intelligence that we have seen over the last little while has been a huge step forward, way ahead of any other ed tech we've seen. Tell me this, just so I know, Tom, have you, do you have much of a background in education? Do you move in those circles yourself? Uh, I don't. So I, I do have a bit of an interest though. So I do, um, I'm a, uh, like a volunteer with a, a mentoring charity uh, in London. So I go like, like once a week, I go and do um, mentoring with uh, with a bunch of sort of secondary age kids at a local school um and i actually did a bit of a presentation to them about chat gpt generative ai just because it's kind of the world i'm operating in and it feels to me like an insane degree of opportunity for young kids now that it's just never happened before you know that, that you could literally be at secondary age and and spin up an entire business yourself within like a year or less you know and go out and be you know 
doing stuff in the world to a degree that I just don't think was possible when I was was that age. Um, so I think, you know, the angle I'm coming at it from is that it seems like a massive opportunity. And the kids that I was talking to really seem to respond well as well. They were very interested and, and clearly some of them are, are using it themselves. A lot of students are using it. Here's the catch, though, I think, Tom. Not a lot of students are using it well. Right. Okay. So you're, you're in this awkward position where you've got a lot of students using it. Most of those students, I'd say in the high 90s, uh, they would be using it quite poorly. So you're really at a crossroads when it comes to being a student in today's environment because what you've got is you could use AI to do all your work for you, right? You could cheat with AI or you could use AI as a bespoke learning tool that is going to guide you through the exact learning sequence you need. So really the two options are cheater or tutor. And it's only one of those ways. Very good. Okay? Very you, you, good. It's, it's the fork in the road. Right? And so I really do think many of our young people, unfortunately, are cheating with it. Hey, chat GPT, write me an essay on this. And what are they doing? Well, they're chopping their own legs out from under them when it comes to receiving a good education. So I, I'm really passionate about telling students how to use it wisely. I'm grateful to God for people like you, Tom, as well, who are out there telling students how to use this because... The environment has changed. We now have generative AI. But if we just assume that these children, because they're young and digital natives, are going to use it well, we're actually going to set them up to fail. Yeah, 100 percent. So it, it, I found it interesting um, recently, the uh, apparently the chat GPT web traffic has been dropping um for the first time which has surprised a lot of people and the kind of going theory is that it's um it's because the school term has finished um I, I don't know what the terms are like what the school terms are in australia because i know you're the other side of the world i don't know if you do it the same way that we do but um schools are broken up and so the, the theory is that a lot of the drop off is because kids aren't using it to do their homework anymore right um i mean is that the sort of thing that you've seen a lot of as a teacher um, are you see, are, 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 obviously you wouldn't always know, but the classic thing is, you know, that you get the, as an AI language model in like the essay answers or whatever. Uh, have you come across that? All the time, Tom. Really? And look, right. really, you do know, you do know okay. because a student will say, oh yeah, but you can't detect it because the latest AI plagiarism detectors aren't that good. And you go, yeah, but I've also taught you for the whole year and I know how you write. <laughs> you, don't, you don't write like that. You can't write like that. So you go, come on, man. I, I That's a great point. That's a, you don't even think about that, do you? But yeah. No. So you got kids saying, run it through a plagiarism checker. I guarantee it'll be fine. You go, I'm not even going to bother with that step. I know you've ripped this off. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's quite simple. But to be honest with you, I see it in class too. I don't necessarily discourage it. But let me tell you one of the great fears that I have actually, Tom. It's that the students who are adopting this technology and this is what happens when we don't take a school-wide approach. If you just leave it up to the students themselves, the students who adopt this technology, who are they going to be? They're going to be the sorts of students who go, yep, I can learn new things, I can master technologies, uh, and I can introduce myself to a brand new way of operating and benefit from it. So people with that sort of mindset, they're actually going to be the smart students anyway. Who are the students who aren't going to be using it? They're going to be the people who think, I, I can't wrap my head around new things. I'm too dumb for this. I'm no good with technology. They're actually going to be the sort of students who don't have high academic attainment. So what's happening? The educational gap is increasing. The gap between the most uh, educationally savvy student and the most educationally disadvantaged student, it's growing. And wow. that's really sad because that's something we've actually been trying to close for quite a long time. So if we're not careful... Having chat GPT in your classroom in an unmonitored way, what can it be like? It can be like putting a teacher aid right next to the smart kids in your class, having them give them one-on-one -on -one help, and you leave the students who are already struggling on their own. And let me tell you, that is the last thing you want. Yeah. So that's really interesting that you say that because I think um, a lot of the kind of theory around um generative ai up until now has been that it'll be like the great leveler like it will bring the people who have perhaps lower levels of um productivity or you know intelligence or attainment it will bring them up so that we're all kind of super powered you know ai enhanced beings but what, what you're saying from a from an educational level sounds like it's actually the opposite 
Absolutely. It's like the Tour de France, the year they started doping, right? They always talk <laughs> about a two-speed race, right? A two-speed race. You've got blokes who've got an extra bag of blood in them and blokes who don't. And yeah. it's pretty clear to see who's doing what. And that's, the, and that's exactly how it is in the classroom because wow. people who think it'll be the great leveler, it sure can be. It sure can be. But it actually takes a level of training to be proficient in these things. And if you're not proficient, you're going to get left in the dust by someone who is. Yeah. Now, the good news, of course, is that as an educator, it's actually my business to train and shape students and to, the sh and to show them how to navigate the world. So I'm quite confident that we can do that. But I tell you, there are so many schools who just say, look, uh, it may be a fad. It might be a flash in the pan. We're not going to necessarily worry about a school-wide AI or generative AI policy. And I've got to tell you, there aren't too many bigger mistakes you will make than that. Yeah. So is that, are you, are you seeing resistance then to these? Because to me, it seems like, I mean, some of the stuff that I want to come on to is talk to you about is um, how it's like unequivocal that it's going to have a big impact on, on the future of, of kids at school. So are you finding that there's resistance in the kind of educational world to, to embracing AI? There's no resistance. The only resistance would be apathy. So right, people okay, saying, oh, okay. look, it's not, a, it's just like, come on, man, it's another fad. It's the Tamagotchi of the 2020s. And in reality, uh, I saw an interesting study recently that said, the more you know about AI, the higher you are going to estimate its potential to change the world. Right. So the closer you get to this thing, the more you go, boys, this is big. Yeah. Right? And, if you, and if you don't think about it at all, you go, well, you know, not really. It's not a, not a big deal. It's like switching maybe from a VCR to a DVD player. But the thing about this is, Tom, you and I exist in a very niche space online, right? We're in Twitter. We're in the AI um, part of Twitter that the resting level of understanding is very, very high. Yeah. We all get it. And, it. and it can be quite strange actually stepping out of that bubble. And I was talking to a mum two days ago who hadn't heard of ChatGPT. And you're going, wow. So yeah. this Twitter bubble that we are in right here, the certain parts of YouTube or social media, it really, it is not real life. And yeah. the people that we are conversing with every day online are not an accurate sample of the population out there. So there's a lot of people who just haven't got up to speed. Yeah, I mean, it is, uh, you do forget how early it is uh, and and how the the actual real game changing impact is, is probably still yet to come, right? It's probably the tools that people are going to be building on the, on the GPT API. It's probably not even chat GPT. It's going to be some other thing that we haven't even conceived of yet. That's going to be launched in the next 12 months or whatever. Um, but I mean, it seems to me like, like incredibly obvious that this is going to change everything. Like, I mean, do you think that that coursework is even going to, be a thing in like the next few years because i kind of can't see how coursework as i used to know it where i'd go you know i'd be given an assignment go away read some books you know write things on a you know pieces of paper and then give you these sort of you know sheath of pieces of paper that i've written down on myself as my coursework like that just seems like that isn't that, that as a conception just won't that the, there is there's no way to assess somebody on coursework that they've gone away and done because the degree of help that they're going to have from AI is just going to be too great once this becomes, you know, once once everyone's using it. And my assumption is that at some point, everyone will be using it. Like, how do you think about that? Like, how are you thinking about how you're going to actually assess these kids in the future? Well, you're exactly right. The take-home exam is completely busted. The do an essay in two weeks at home, completely busted. You right. do not want to be handing those out. You just don't. Because what are you going to do? You're going to get a completely inaccurate reading on how well your students are doing academically. Right? And that's what, an, that's what an assessment is for. You're meant to assess learning. You're meant to get students to represent their learning to you so you can say, yes, you've learned it or no, you haven't. And that's just, as I said, it's busted. It's not going to work. The funny thing about this is actually, Tom, the very things that we're being pushed into now are the very things we were trying to get away from for the last three decades. People have been saying for 30 years, oh, exams are not a good way to measure understanding. Exam taking is its own skill. And so we shouldn't get people to do tests in classroom in exam conditions because, you know, 
um, a portfolio would be better or a take-home exam would be better. People yeah. say, yeah, we, sh we should move away from in-class tests. We should move away from handwriting on sheets of lined paper in a room. Actually, that seems to be exactly what we're going to have to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the only way you're actually going to be able to, uh, to, to assess them. Yeah, interesting. Um, yeah, and so do you, do you now have to assume that everyone has an AI assistant at home helping them with their homework? Like, I mean, you said that, it, you know, you can tell if, if ChatGPT has written the whole essay, but like, are you now assuming that there's some degree of AI augmentation to any piece of homework now? Well, in some ways, there has been for a long time. I mean, Grammarly runs a basic version of AI. Mm. Spellchecker recently runs a basic version of AI. And if you look into the education space, some of the false positives that we've been seeing in, in Australia, we call it pre-tertiary. So your grades 11 and 12, right before you head to uni, it's pretty high stakes. There've been a bunch of people pinged for AI plagiarism and they're saying, hey, I wrote the thing. I got Grammarly to go over it. Sue me. You know, so no, I didn't get chat GPT to write this essay. I just got Grammarly to check it out. Right. And yeah, so yeah. in some ways, AI has been in the mix for a while, but not this kind of generative AI that you're talking about. I'd, I'd love to assume everyone is using it and has access to it because that would be an even playing field. Although it's pretty clear from just a moment's glance that there are still some people not using it. And I actually do fear that they put themselves at a pretty big disadvantage there. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I mean, and that disadvantage is only going to grow, right? Like there's 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 a huge incentive to to fold it in, and I think this is the same. This will be the same when they reach the world of work. I think it's kind of you know happening already. Like if you're not using AI tools, you're going to put yourself at a massive disadvantage that's going to grow and grow and grow over time as the tools improve. Um, so yeah, I mean, it must be a big worry. I mean, so do do you think then that that growing gap between ai powered humans and non ai powered humans is like the biggest threat of this of this thing and because i want to talk about threats and i want to talk about opportunities and i know there are loads of opportunities for, for for growth but just to sort of round off on on threats is that the biggest threat the biggest thing that you're worried about yeah it, that is one of the biggest threats out there but perhaps not in the direction you think so it's not a threat for the people not using it because at the moment, Tom, all the assessments are designed for people not using it. Right. Right. The threat is really for the person who skates through their entire secondary education without ever having to switch their brain on because they've got generative AI to complete yeah. all their assignments. That's the scary thing because yeah. that's the person who will skate through on straight days and get absolutely nothing out of their education and be infinitely worse off for it as they graduate. So it's I have absolutely no fear of the people who aren't using AI because at the moment, the entire structure is built for people who aren't using AI. It's the people who are in the non-generative AI structure and are using generative AI. Well, they're going to absolutely breeze through and do themselves an incalculable disservice as a result. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose that clearly you don't want them never using it either right like you, you don't want to say well no that you know you, you shouldn't experiment with this tool like you just want them to use it in the right way and you know to to do the the the, the stuff that is the, the brain the brain power that's required with their own heads and use the tools to expand what they're doing so i i suppose the important thing then is getting that education about how to use ai on the syllabus as quickly as possible right to to because kids aren't going to know this right like they're just going to see that there's this tool that can make their homework easier why wouldn't i use it i got to tell you one of the biggest mistakes that educators make is assuming a level of technological proficiency in students that just isn't there right you're, oh they're digital natives they understand these things actually what they understand is how to play roblox okay you try and get them to save <laughs> try and get them to save their files in folders and have no idea what's going on Right. So we can, just because these people have grown up around the internet and around TV and around laptops and iPads, we think that they're really, really good at these things. Just between you and I, Tom, they're actually not really good at these things. So we need to assume that those who are using it are using it terribly and basically build from the ground up. So yes, right. we do need to be rolling out curricula across our school to show people how to use generative AI because that's just the world we're living in. 
It's just the whole environment has changed. A bit of a tangent here, but there's a, a, a technological theorist, a bloke called Neil Postman, who did a lot of work in this area. And he argued that technological change is not additive, it's ecological. So when you get a brand new piece of technology, it's not like you've got a big array of tools and just one more piece of technology there. That would be additive change. He said, no, 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 it's ecological change. The new technology changes the entire environment. The analogy I often use to explain that is we have two big cities in Tasmania, Launceston up north and Hobart down south. Okay. And the other day, my wife, who was pretty heavily pregnant, and my two young boys, they're sort of three and one. We were driving back down and the youngest bloke, and I'm sorry to your listeners to describe it this way, the youngest bloke um, had a dirty nappy. Right? <laughs> now, what you had, that, that was not an additive change. That was not exactly the same car as before and one small dirty nappy. That was actually an entirely different car at that point. It, it, it was an ecological change. The whole landscape had changed. You know what I mean? Uh, now, Neil, Neil Postman, um, Neil Postman, he uses yeah. a slightly more savoury analogy. He says you've got a glass of water and a drip of red dye. You don't. It's it's not additive change there when you just have the same glass of water and a drop of red dye in there. It's now a red glass of water, right? Yeah. And so we, with the advent of AI, have experienced ecological change. We are in a brand new environment. And so it's on us as educators, but more so it's on our schools and our principals and school leaders to realize that we've had an environmental change and we need to adapt to our new environment. Otherwise, we're just going to do our students a disservice. Yeah. And so, like, would you say then that? that ecological change, as you put it, that red dye of AI is now going to change the entire educational landscape. Like we really need to think from the ground up because the way I look at this, I, I sort of think that a lot of stuff that I learned in school, I just wouldn't need in the future, but there's a lot of stuff that I would never, have, my teachers would never have even considered to teach me that I really will need in future, right? Like, you know, I, I never would have learned like I, I kind of feel like well you need to know what an api is you know you need to understand how you can integrate large language models into other things you know you need to understand how the sort of software ecosystem works like is it that the whole of education needs to change are there entire subjects that we probably just need to get rid of and, and start again it's a really good question and there are two schools of thought here one is that you need to train people in exactly what they're going to do in real life. And another is that you, you can train people on stuff that has nothing to do with real life. You could read Shakespeare and Jane Austen and Plato and Socrates, but if you're training them in how to think, the rest of their life is going to be an absolute breeze. Yeah. And I, I'm almost in the latter, right? If you've been trained to think, if you've been given good critical and creative thinking skills, if you've been taught to weigh up options in your mind and debate with a partner and all these sorts of things, you'd be able to wrap your head around that sort of stuff pretty quickly. I was, I'm very grateful for the education that I received at Calvin Christian School. And I think as a consequence of that, I, I can tackle these sorts of things now. If just the sheer rate of change of education, of uh, artificial intelligence rather, is so high that if we were training students in grade eight or nine or 10 now on what AI is doing, it would be completely redundant by the time they got out. We're moving so quickly. Yeah, Technology that would have taken a generation to change before, well, it's now taking you know, one or two years to change as much as it would have changed in a, in a generation. So I've, I'm a big believer in let, let's train these students in how to think. And then when, I, when they get out there, when they face things that we could not possibly have foreseen, we will have stood them in good stead. Great. Well, look, I also then just I, I'm conscious of your time and I want to talk about my teacher aid, uh, which uh, I know is, is the, the product that you're you're launching quickly. Then just let's talk about parents briefly and how you would advise them um, on AI, because, you know, I, I suspect lots of people listening to this or, or watching this on, on, on Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever will be parents. Um, certainly a lot of my colleagues are and they're all thinking about how do they, you know, 
tell their kids about this stuff. What are you advising parents when you're speaking to them at, you know, uh, parent teacher meetings or whatever about AI? Well, I come from a very particular philosophy of student and school and parent relationships. So in my school, we say this, and this comes from a particular religious worldview, but it will just give you an insight into where we're coming from. We say God gave, he gave children to parents. He didn't give them to the government. He didn't give them to schools. He didn't give them to churches. He gave them to parents. So the parent is the one who has the final authority and the final responsibility in these sorts of matters. So the big thing I'm saying is parents, you need to be talking with your children regularly. And that, a big outworking of that is when the parent teachers come around, sometimes they're asking me how the kid is going. Most of the time I'm asking them. I expect right. them to be a subject matter ex- expert on their child. Yeah, uh, uh, the child is theirs. And so I, I don't want to be the person who they're coming to for advice on their child. I want it to be the other way around. And by and large in our school community, that's how it works. And so I've, I've been encouraging parents to have discussions around these matters. Just take your kid's temperature. Are they using it? Are they finding it beneficial? Do they find it bland and boring and banal and always churning out similar stuff? Or have they really gone down a rabbit hole? You know, so I encourage parents always just to have an open dialogue because they're the people who bear the primary responsibility for that child. And they're also the person who cares more for that child than I ever possibly could. So that's my my two big sort of take homes for the parent is just have uh, lots of discussions and keep an open line of communication with the school. And then at a broader sort of higher level, I would be a huge fan. Now, this takes a little bit of administration. I would be a huge fan, however, of schools running dedicated nights about artificial intelligence. All right. So, yes, the child belongs to the parent, but we as schools need to be leaders in the educational space. That's what parents have partnered with us for. They have said they want us to take a leading role in educating their children. So if the educational landscape has changed, which it has, we should actually be having avenues for parents to learn more about that. So I think the local school should be a place where parents can go and learn about AI, learn about how to best use it, how to really milk it for all its goodness and be wary of some of the ethical dilemmas there. So I think schools should be on the forefront. And there are plenty of people around there, including myself, who have led professional development in schools and led parent information nights. And we're always keen to do so. So I don't think there's any shortage of people who've got a good level of understanding here, who'd be willing to help schools out. Great. Good stuff. Um, So then on the opportunity side, um, if you put your most optimistic hat on for the future of, of the education space, what is the, paint me a picture of what the, what the perfect future could look like with AI powering education. I'll give you one word. And this is the thing I'm most bullish about. This is the thing I'm most excited about. The one big word, the big heavy lifting that AI will do, differentiation. Now, you might hear that and go, what do you mean differentiation? Uh, Differentiation, That's exactly my reaction. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Differentiation is where we are able to take our bog standard lesson and tweak it a little bit for this person who struggles with numeracy and tweak it a little bit for that person who struggles with literacy and bring it down a rating, a reading grade or two for this other person over here. So in the education context, Tom, what will often happen is you've got your year eight English, but in reality, you've got five or 10 students on a learning plan. What does that mean? That means they're probably not at grade level and they're going to need specific adjustments. At the moment, teachers are dying under the weight of the administ trivia that they've got to do. So they've got every lesson, every 40-minute chunk of time, they've got to make 5, 10, 15 tweaks. A friend of mine teaches an English class, grade 9 English, 23 students, 21 learning plans. Wow. All right? Now, that's a nearly impossible job for them to tailor that learning to all those students. So what am I excited about? Well, AI will absolutely make short work of that. You can put it in the same text, right? Say we had an article we wanted to read as a class. Now, I know if it's a grade 10 class, there might be six students who can't read at grade level. Now, before, say it's a thousand-word article, that might have taken me 30 minutes to transpose that down a couple of reading grade levels for us to read an article for 10 minutes together. 
Now, that's not a very good use of my time. So what happens? The educational needs of those students, they're not catered for. Now, that takes 15 seconds with AI. So I can actually take way better care of the students in my class by leveraging AI tools. And that's what I'm most excited about. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I, so it's, it's essentially a question of volume, right? It's like productivity and time, which is basically where all of the opportunity for AI is in, in every industry, right? Like in the, in the marketing world, we kind of think about personalization, uh, which I guess is kind of the, the, the same thing, except uh, it's not children that we're focused on. It's, it's target audiences, you know, potential customers. So we might make, you know, 50 different creative assets for a LinkedIn campaign, and they're each tailored for very, very specific target niches. Um, and it's like, that's the kind of thing that would have taken your copy and design team weeks previously. Mm. Whereas now you can just, you can, you can ping out those very slightly tweaked versions of essentially the same thing, but with, with personalizations in there far quicker. And so it's kind of the same thing, right? It's, it's, it's just turbocharging the productivity of, because the teachers that you're talking about, presumably if you gave them enough time, they would be able to create individual learning plans for every child really, really well. But because they're drowning under the, the weight of the work, it's just not possible. Whereas now it is. And that's exactly why. So I'm the CEO and co-founder of myteacheraid.com. It's an AI tool for teachers. And that's why we chose my teacher aid as a driving metaphor, because there are people out there who say AI will replace teachers and they've got rocks in their head. AI will never <laughs> replace teachers. What it will allow teachers to do, however, as you said, is to do much more work in much less time, which is exactly what we've been trying to do. And I've got to tell you this, Tom, there's a reason why 50% of teachers have burned out. I don't know if you knew that, 50%. I did so not. if you're in the general population of Australia, you have a one in 10 chance of burning out. If you're a teacher, it's one in two. Wow. All right. So 70% of teachers say they've got just, far just, too much work. Just to be clear, that's the Australian market. That's not uh, global. Yeah, it is the Australian yes. market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But okay. we're, we're, yeah. Yeah. So, and I have absolutely no reason to believe it's different anywhere else. In fact, I've been seeing some stuff out of the UK recently that makes me think, yeah, yeah it would be similar, if not worse. Yeah, I'm sure it would. I'm sure it would. Yeah. I, that's kind of why I ask, because I suspect it would be similar in the UK. Um, I don't have the stats at my thing. fingertips, but I, I, my hunch is it would be similar. Exactly. And so that's why we chose a teacher aid for our driving metaphor for AI, because it's not going to replace the teacher. What will it be like, though? It'll be like my school has allocated me a full-time teacher aid. So I can go and teach my lesson and say to that teacher aid, hey, can you take this essay um, and bring it down three reading grade levels so I can go through it with the class and have a differentiated version. Now, say then I went and taught and the next 40 minutes, my teacher aid spent doing that thing. Well, that's exactly the benefit that I get from having my own personal AI teacher aid, right? And that's why we've named our tech startup, the AI for teachers, my teacher aid, because that's what it's going to do. It's going to be like a full-time teacher aid dedicated to serving you and your students. And yeah. if you ask teachers what they want, really, it's not necessarily about more money or more time off. They just want to be able to do their job. As I said, 70% yeah. of teachers say that I don't have enough time to do my job. And that's a crazy feeling. All right. I can, I can, as a, so speaking from personal experience, I can work all day and love it. The one thing that will crack me like an egg is if I feel like I'm doing a bad job at my job and then I cannot work very hard at all. all right? That's the one thing that really demotivates me. So what we're doing for teachers is we're actually allowing them to do a good job of their job by allowing them to harness the powers of AI. Yeah. It's, it's the, like this is the conversation around AI that's been that's been really really prevalent i think is this idea of whether ai will replace profession x or whether we will augment profession x with ai and make them far more productive and um you know there are these sort of two schools of thought right one being that we get replaced with ai and you could say the same and you're talking about teachers you could say the same about marketers analysts software developers you name it there's a conversation about whether it's going to be replaced with ai or whether AI is just going to turbocharge their productivity. And it certainly seems like at the moment, the people I speak to primarily in, in, in marketing and, and in, in business, 
are falling on on your side of the conversation, which is that humans aren't just going to sort of say, oh, well, never mind, I'll just let the AI do it now. The, the most productive ones are going to be really excited about it and say, amazing, I can be like 10 times the the teacher or marketer or analyst that I was a year ago with all of these new tools. So my teacher aid then, I've seen you've, I, I, I've been doing some Googling ahead of our conversation. I've seen that you've had some, uh, some nice press coverage. It seems like you're starting to make a few waves. Um, tell me it, like what the product exactly is. So is it essentially like, like you said, um, it's for creating materials for lesson plans for students, or is it like a portal or a platform? Like talk me through exactly what it kind of looks like if you're a customer. So my teacher aid, and boy, I've got to tell you, Tom, I'm glad you asked. My teacher aid is going to be <laughs> your You're website. Welcome. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll slip you the 10 quid later on. Uh, um, yeah, so it's a website. You can go there at the moment. So it's currently live. We're taking admissions for our pilot program. So our pilot program, interestingly enough, and, and life has a funny way of throwing these things at you. Uh, my pilot program um, will launch in the exact same week that my wife will launch our third son. So that's wow. going to be a very interesting week. Big week. However, yeah. it will be a, it will be a big week. We've uh, thankfully I've got a good team of people around me. So there are actually six of us uh, on staff at the moment. So there'll be more than enough hands on deck. So what it will be, it will be a website. People can go to it. Uh, it is aimed at school-based subscriptions. So your school will subscribe to it. And what will you, you be able to do? You'll be able to do every administrative task you normally do, but with the power of AI. So we're talking lesson planning, unit planning, curriculum alignment, marking, assessment, resource creation, all these things which take so much time. We have tailor-made an AI, especially for those endeavours. So it's been trained for the education-based purposes uh, and that's exactly why it's going to be so important from students uh, and uh, rather it'll be so important for teachers because what teachers often don't do is they don't have the time to be able to learn how to use generative AI. So a lot of teachers I've spoken to, they're just not real pleased with chat GPT. They think it's boring. And the reason I think it's boring is actually because they're using boring prompts. There's a real skill, isn't there? And I, yeah. you were talking to me off air about mid journey it's a certain language you've got to learn to speak to be able to communicate well with a language model. And if you can't speak it, you're just going to get rubbish. So what my teacher aid does is we effectively have the first five or 10 conversational turns with the AI for you so that you can give very basic prompts and you can get world-class results. Okay. Just to put it in perspective, I know teachers have probably used chat GPT to write them lesson plans. One of my team members has been working on our lesson planning prompt sequence for the last two weeks, nearly full time. So when wow. I say world class, I mean it. We have spent serious time and energy making sure that you can quickly and reliably get the best performance out of generative AI for your teaching practice. Interesting. So I mean, that's really, I, I hadn't even thought that that was a monetize. It's like priming the large language model with a conversation could be like a monetizable business. But I, now you say it, it seems so obvious. Like, you know, you're essentially just priming it, right? Um, with very well-crafted prompts to make sure that you're going to get exactly the kind of response that you want. And I assume nothing that you don't. So like, how are you thinking about hallucinations and taking out the, the kind of stuff that is that is not relevant. Boy, oh boy, Tom. Again, just so glad you asked. So we are one of the few <laughs> AI. Just to be clear to got... listeners, I haven't been I haven't been primed myself on this. I I, I am ge like genuinely curious to, to to know. So we have effectively two pools that the user will be drawing from. When they engage with our AI, the responses will be generated, yes, from communication with the large language model, but also from our own proprietary database of curriculum. Okay, because if you, so Australia has just moved to version nine of the Australian curriculum. We were at version 8.4. Now version nine came in last year. 
chat GPT, when it's not connected to the internet, doesn't know anything about version nine. So it cannot help you plan right. yeah. version nine specific material. So we have our own proprietary database that our data scientists have worked up. And so every time you ask for um, information about Australian curriculum version nine, by the way, we also have the curricula, two, two of the biggest curricula in India and several other curricula from the States. So we're in the international, we have an international scope. However, when you're asking for curriculum, it's not just making it up like chat GPT is so want to do. It is not hallucinating because it's pulling from a very discreet database, which contains the curriculum itself. Because these curriculum standards and reporting authorities, when they come and audit your school, they will hang you out to dry if ChatGPT has hallucinated half of the curriculum standards in your unit plan and it turns out you've been teaching students gobbledygook. You cannot afford to have that sort of mistake. So yeah. that's why we have, we have not only utilised the power, the massive power of a large language model, we've also got our proprietary database that will pull from different curricula, the ones that are relevant to you in your educational setting to make sure that you're getting the best, most accurate information out of my teacher aid. Awesome. Um, well, look, I believe we're coming up um, to the end of, uh, of, of your time today. Uh, so I, I don't want to run over too much. Is there anything else um, about my teacher aid or, or anything else that, that you want to get across or discuss um, before we uh, start to wrap? I just really encourage people to go to myteacheraid.com. Now that's aid with an A-I-D-E. So there's various spellings across the world, but it is myteacheraid.com. At the moment, you can apply for our pilot program. Now, one of the benefits of that is you get to be involved in shaping the way that our tools work. And there's, yes, philanthropic benefits for you there. You get to shape the way that students uh, receive resources all across the world. However, there's also a 10% discount for any school whose staff participate in the trial. So there's that to think about. I think this will be a school. If you're a teacher, you want your school using this. You want to have access to this tool. And one of the things that will sweeten the deal for the school is saying, hey, you know what? Right out of the gate, I've got us 10% off. So I encourage schools, uh, I encourage teachers to go there, secure that discount for your school. And I'm confident that we, uh, along with the schools that we partner with, are going to go a long way towards reducing teacher burnout and increasing student educational attainment. Awesome. Well, very best of luck. Um, I would share your uh, encouragement to any to any teachers or uh, schools out there. I will link to your Twitter and um, and my teacher aid in the in the show notes. Um, yeah. Well, look, Paul. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, I've really enjoyed the chat. It's I think an incredibly exciting and interesting space that uh, that you're applying AI to, and um, yeah, you could potentially be driving a very exciting future for everyone once these kids uh, with their super AI charged educations are unleashed on the world. Well, let me tell you this, Tom, I've had an absolute ball. It's been a great discussion and uh, no pressure, but I'd love to be back sometime. For sure. For sure. We'll definitely have you back. hundred um, percent. Lovely. All right. Thanks very much, Paul. All right. Take care.